Hello and welcome to a new topic on this channel, specifically Ireland in the period immediately following the event known as the Restoration. Following the conclusion of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, the end of which I covered in a previous series on this channel, Charles II was restored to the throne his father had occupied before his abrupt removal. England was once again a monarchy, though Parliament had much more teeth than it had in the reign of Charles I. Though Charles II had been restored by his Parliament, he had not been handed a kingdom in which he could do as he pleased. There were many conflicting interests in England and Ireland, all of whom were demanding recognition of their rights, and often the removal of the rights of their opponents. One of the most vocal of these factions was the remnants of the Catholic Confederacy in Ireland. Though the organisation itself was by now defunct, its myriad members were outraged at the land confiscations affected by Cromwell following the completion of the conquest, and the settlement of Puritan families on the newly taken land. These Puritan settlers were another faction Charles needed to somehow placate, though unfortunately for him, their demands were in direct opposition to those of the old Confederate Catholics. The Puritans were just as determined to hold on to their new lands, as their former owners were to reclaim them. For Charles, this effectively meant that no matter what he did, he couldn't please everyone. His ultimate resolution therefore placated some, and enraged others. In the words of Morris O'Connor, writing in 1896, The conduct of the king, however, reflected the passions of the hour, and was marked by the favouritism and want of good faith characteristic of his house. Charles's reforms began with the Anglican Church, which had many of its former possessions returned to it. Its episcopate, which Cromwell had practically done away with, was restored to favour. Many Presbyterian ministers were expelled from the religious houses they had been granted by the previous regime, and soon had a religious test imposed upon them. Soon after this, Charles made sure that his friends were well looked after. While many of the confiscated lands were slow to leave the hands of the state, Several of Charles's friends received generous new grants of estates. The Dukes of York and Ormond were some of those who benefited most from this behaviour. Thousands of acres of land were handed out in this manner, with very little regard for fairness or even sound policy. At this time, Lord Hyde, the first Earl of Clarendon, was chief advisor to Charles II. Clarendon was known for his fiercely anti-Catholic worldview and he sought to impose his own measures on England's subject Catholics via his influence with the king. Though Charles wanted to look after his friends, some of which were Catholic, he consented to Clarendon's view, and soon after it was announced that the so-called English interest was to be maintained in Ireland. Claims on Irish land were thereafter arranged on the following basis. The adventurers and Cromwellian soldiers who had gained new lands following the conquest were, with a few exceptions, to maintain ownership of them. Certain classes of Protestants were also earmarked to regain lost estates. This of course left about 4,000 to 5,000 angry Catholics still bereft of their former lands. Another plan was devised to calm them down, which would hopefully be acceptable to the Puritan party as well. The former Catholic landowners were to have their old property returned to them, on the condition that they could pass a test of innocence. Naturally, of course, very few Catholics were expected to be declared wholly innocent of the damages against the Crown from 1641 onwards. The Irish Parliament had by this point been restored, and was filled with a mix of Protestants and Puritan zealots. Despite the fact that very few Catholics stood a chance of regaining their lands as a result of Charles's new decree, Parliament was nonetheless outraged. Discussion of the matter was transferred to Whitehall, but very little was changed about the proposed terms and the so-called Act of Settlement was passed. While all this had been taking place, a commission had been appointed to begin assessing the innocence of various Catholics. As it turned out, a significantly larger number were managing to secure a positive verdict on their land restoration pleas than Charles had perhaps intended. Naturally, the Irish Parliament was further infuriated by what they saw as a confirmation that their grievances with the King were valid. This act actually caused so much consternation that there was talk of rebellion among the Cromwellian settlers, which prompted Charles and his ministers to make an amendment to the Act of Settlement. This act became known as the Act of Explanation, 
Under its terms, the Cromwellian settlers were obliged to hand over a third of their lands to those Catholics who had been judged innocent. The settlers were absolutely incandescent over this amendment, and it didn't make the Catholic faction much happier either. Even after the third of the Cromwellian land had been doled out to innocent Catholics, 3,000 to 4,000 former landowners were still locked out of their old family estates. Through the amendment, Charles managed to quite successfully please nobody at all. Though both Protestants and Puritans had been angered by the Act of Explanation, they could at least content themselves with their complete domination of Parliament, and the greater portion of land they still retained. Catholics too were receiving concessions, as a result of Charles's continuing attempts to please everybody. The Duke of Ormond was assigned the duty of government in Ireland, and though he staunchly upheld the Anglican Church, he allowed Catholic priests to practice their ministry as well. O'Connor describes this policy as not profound or far-sighted, but it was wise, prudent, and perhaps suited to the time. Like other Lord Lieutenants before him, Ormond was of the belief that a strong state presence needed to be maintained in Ireland if peace was to be possible. Under his government, the Irish army was enlarged, and local militias were trained in certain areas to fulfil the basic functions of a police force. Ormond's other focus was increasing the economic viability of the island. For most of Ireland's occupation by the English crown, it was a liability to the treasury rather than an asset. It was Ormond's aim to make the kingdom pay for itself at the very least, and maybe even turn a profit. To achieve this aim, he encouraged trade and more efficient agricultural practices. The linen and wool trade, which had almost been annihilated during the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, were also revived under Ormond's auspices. Ormond was also responsible for some of the first projects which might be termed public works in Ireland. Kilkenny College is an example of one of these, and O'Connor also mentions a hospital for soldiers, but I doubt the average inhabitant of Ireland felt that this constituted a public work. For 25 years following Charles II's restoration to power, Ireland was quiet. Ormond governed as Lord Lieutenant for most of this time, but not all. In 1670, Ormond was replaced as governor by Lord Barclay of Stratton. Barclay was appointed to the role as part of a treaty with the French that demanded greater concessions for Charles's Catholic subjects. As soon as he entered office, Lord Barclay immediately made it clear where his sympathies lay. Almost straight away, Catholics began to be admitted to state offices that they had previously been locked out of. Fresh protests sprang up against some aspects of the Act of Settlement, and Mass was even celebrated in Dublin. These changes were very worrying for Ireland's Protestant population, and caused consternation in England as well. The treaty with the French was denounced at Westminster, and Lord Barclay was unceremoniously ejected from his office in favour of Lord Essex. Essex swiftly stamped on any hopes the Catholic Irish had been entertaining about gaining control of the machinery of state. The Protestant ascendancy was firmly reasserted, and Essex maintained the peace in Ireland until Ormond was once more reassigned to the post, which he would hold all the way up to the crowning of James II in 1685. The aftermath of a royal succession can often be a turbulent time in any kingdom, as the malcontents of the previous regime attempt to make their anger felt before the state can be reorganised. Luckily for James II, Ireland was surprisingly quiet when he took the throne. Most of the active Irish leaders were either serving abroad in foreign armies or peaceful for now. The influence of the state in Ireland was actually at an all-time high, and O'Connor is of the opinion that had Catholics been slowly reintegrated into the government, much future bloodshed could have been avoided. To be fair to James, though, his hands were more or less tied. He could not make sweeping reforms to Catholic rights without sending the Irish Parliament into an angry tailspin, which would be bound to cause trouble. On the other hand, the system was so blatantly unjust that James must have known it could only lead to a different sort of trouble down the line. James's first act as king was to replace the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, then the Duke of Ormond, with the Earl of Clarendon, a pick which would have pleased the Protestant faction in Ireland. However, the orders Clarendon was given were less pleasing to them. The new Lord Lieutenant was to uphold the Acts of Settlement, and begin admitting Catholics to state offices. Much like his predecessor, 
James was trying to please both sides, and he was destined to see about the same amount of success on that front. No doubt the Earl of Clarendon chafed at having to admit Catholics to office, but he appears to have obeyed the King's directive. Some Catholics were even appointed to the council in Dublin, which was a very significant change. Maybe, with time, Clarendon would have softened the idea of coexisting with his theological opposites, had he been allowed to feel like a real governor. Despite the fact that he was Lord Lieutenant, the Irish army was not under his command. In Ormond's day, the Irish army had been under the purview of his office, and as I mentioned earlier, he'd possessed the authority to enlarge it. James made the somewhat baffling decision to place the Irish army under the command of a man named Richard Talbot, who was the Lord of Tyrconnell. Talbot was a Catholic and vocally opposed the Protestant domination of state affairs in Ireland. Naturally, the appointment of Talbot caused anger in many quarters, and not the least incensed was the Earl of Clarendon. Once Talbot was in control of the army, he immediately set about implementing reform. His first act was to disband the trained militia that had been formed by Ormond, and the main reason for this was that the majority of its members were Protestants. Next, Talbot began dismissing Protestant officers from prominent positions in the army's command structure, and filling the gaps with Catholics instead. These reforms caused outrage, and a tinge of unease in the Protestant classes of Ireland. This unease soon developed into open fear, when Talbot replaced Clarendon as Lord Lieutenant in 1687. James was at last nailing his colours to the mast. He had evidently given up on his policy of blanket appeasement and picked a side. The Irish army was once again enlarged, and the principal offices of state were filled with Catholic statesmen, while the judiciary received a similar treatment. Talbot was emboldened by his king's clear support for his Catholic subjects, and began to challenge the acts of settlement. It was this that triggered a widespread rising, as dispossessed Catholics again laid claim to the lands that had been confiscated from them following the Cromwellian conquest. Ireland's Catholics were delighted at this sudden reversal of fortunes, but their patron James would soon receive a blunt reminder that the King of England could no longer do exactly what he wanted without thought for the ideals and values of the majority of his subjects. Members of the English Parliament invited William of Orange to take over the English throne. William, of course, accepted this invitation and landed at Brixham on the 5th of November, 1688. At the approach of William, James's troops deserted him, and the former king was forced to go into exile in France to save his own skin. This left the rising in Ireland abruptly without political protection. No army came from England to put down the rebellion, though, and on the 14th of March, 1689, James landed in Ireland, hoping to gather support to reclaim his throne across the sea. He would get the support he desired, as Ireland's Catholics understood all too well that their fortunes, and that of the exile king, were now joined at the hip. If the Catholic Irish wanted to hold on to their newfound supremacy, they were going to have to fight for it. That's where I'm going to leave the narrative for this episode. Next time I'll be covering the conflict that erupted as James gathered his Catholic supporters for an attempt on the English throne. I'm aware that this episode is very politics heavy and that the business of state isn't for everyone, but rest assured that we'll be back to the action in my next video. If you have any questions about this video or another one, please leave me a comment or email me at keanrowanyt.youtube at gmail.com. Thank you for listening.